Hey, Jeffrey. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. I'm honestly uh, happy and excited that uh, I was able to get you on. Um, I've had a, a few people from Microsoft at this point, but you're the first uh, creator of any languages of the, the Power BI platform that I've got to bring on. So I, I think that's going to be a really cool session today. Um, I know I've I certainly learn a little bit of uh, of information with every present with every uh, of these streams that I do, and with yours, I'm sure I'm going to learn quite a few new things even about DAX. So I think this is going to be a really really cool uh, topic today. Thanks for having me on your show. It's an honor. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you um, for people tuning in. Uh, Jeffrey has been I. Uh, I don't even know, like the, the, the length of, you've been with Microsoft for quite a long time. Um, and like I just uh, briefly mentioned, you uh, were the, uh, the front runner facilitator with, um, with creating DAX way back in the day when it was still um, uh, an add-on project for, for Excel, you know, uh, but that eventually became Power Pivot and everything else. So you, you've been instrumental in pretty much everything that's led up to the, the current iteration of the, the BI stack within the Microsoft universe. Um, but for, people less familiar with you, do you want to give a little background about yourself? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, as uh, Reid just said, I've been with Microsoft for uh, 17 years. Uh, it's easy to remember my daughter is uh, 17 years old and uh, uh, I moved to, I accepted the offer from Microsoft uh, at the exact hour when she was uh, scheduled to be uh, uh, delivered <laughs> so so it's very easy to remember uh, just remember my daughter's age and uh, I and also amazingly I've been on the same team all these years which is very rare in the high-tech industry uh, that basically tells the uh, lure of this team it's been we have been doing very interesting exciting things all these years uh, and so that's why I've been here. And when we created the DAX, as we just uh, mentioned, uh, it was originally for uh, Excel add-in. It's a still an Excel add-in, uh, 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 Power Pivot. But uh, uh, at that time, uh, it didn't. Uh, the, that project originally didn't uh, 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 grow nearly as fast as Power BI, uh, mainly because uh, Excel. Uh, is not a, just a pure BI tool. It's, mm -hmm. it's used by uh, millions of people all over the world for different kinds of purposes. But in order to release a new uh, BI feature into Excel, we have to wait for Excel to be uh, deployed. And no company is going to just uh, deploy Excel for BI features alone, right? So people always, uh, the old big corporations they have to buy uh, like uh, the entire office suite and they typically wait uh, several years uh, before they deploy. That's before the cloud days. So, but that, uh, even though it's pretty bad for the business, it turns to be a great thing for us. It gave us plenty of time to release a programming language and try it out with uh, some number of users, enough users to give us uh, plenty of feedback uh, for us to have uh, time to do a major uh, overhaul of the language uh, later on. And uh, that makes a much, it's called a super DAX project as for some people who have heard about the name. So we actually, uh, when we first try out the Power Pivot, we used a, a different way and because there's a Power View uh, at that time. So we designed the query language in one way. It didn't work out so well performance wise. And then we learned from it and we actually did a second version of the uh, the query generation and it, and that that is the foundation of the Power BI. And uh, actually when Power BI gets started, it's right at the end of uh, us, us wrapping up uh, uh, the SuperDAX project. So it's a, it's a great uh, coincidence and it's a very opportunistic for the business as well and for us. 
I'm glad that the we've eventually gotten to a platform that supports uh, that's that's as perf um, performance optimized at least as the query language because like you mentioned power power view was uh, great on paper and it looked looked wonderful but it was it was not fast from the UI perspective it especially running Silverlight back in the day. Uh, yeah, there are uh, yeah there are several <laughs> ob obstacles to that, but actually the most critical one is, is not truly integrated into Excel. It's basically yeah. in its own silo, so you can't uh, you can't uh, like a like a, the rest of the Excel audience that is just uh, seamlessly integrated into Excel. So there yeah there are quite a few issues with uh, that product. <laughs> yeah, exactly. M many I can get into, but I, I won't uh, digress too much. I'm just looking at the chatter just as well in the, in the comments, and a, and a lot of people are uh, very happy to be here, and and just in general the the chance to to learn a little bit. Um, as as some people have said, like the Godfather of DAX. So uh, I think there's quite a bit of excitement, and about looks like we're climbing up at at about thirty, just turned to thirty four viewers right now um, in, in the chat. So for people tuning in, what I'll do is a uh, uh, Jer Jeffrey has a couple made like kind of um, prepared topics we'll be going over for the majority of the stream, and then towards uh, towards the end we'll also have an open Q and A. So as questions come up pertaining to the stream that he's or pertaining to the topic that he's presenting, go ahead and drop those in there, and at natural segues I'll ask those, and then we'll have more of an open Q and A, including uh, we we kind of. Uh, Jeffrey and I went over the, um, the questions that was submitted on the, the forums that I posted on social media a couple weeks ago, and we have about 12 or so uh, questions that we'll try to go over at the very end. Okay, sounds great, yeah. Perfect. Um, but yeah, I, I think the, the uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, conversations with the two primary topics of you know, semantics of DAX and then also just composite modeling, which for anybody using Power BI knows got a huge upgrade. Um, uh, with, uh, with composite models because we now have the ability to do it's uh, I, I never remember the full name it's it's dir uh, direct query over analysis services and power bi data sets i think is the full name yeah, yeah i think you got it yeah very very close <laughs> to that yeah uh, essentially it's cool. yeah yeah a co composite model against a power bi data set but that that basically was the last nail in the coffin to account for every possible scenario data combination that you would need uh, with data hosted in various places in the Microsoft stack. So um, I, I think that's been, that was one of the biggest game changers to come out, really. Like that and probably external tools were like massive, massive changes in the last 12 months. Yeah. So when shall we start? Shall we start now? Yeah, yeah. Whenever you're ready, um, you can pop okay. it up on your screen and then I'll, I'll transition over. Yeah, I have uh, prepared a slide deck. Let me know if it's uh, uh, shared on the screen or not. Yeah, coming uh, through. Just I only have a single screen. Sorry, yeah. so I'm, no I'm looking at my slide. Yeah, it's it's coming through just fine. I see some metrics of DAX queries and everything else, and that's being popped through to the stream. Okay, great. Okay, let's get started. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, uh, the DAX query semantics and the. Uh, uh, Composite models and direct query. The reason I want to talk about it is uh, every day uh, when I come to Microsoft, uh, one of the first thing I do is to triage and process uh, customer incidents. So every day we get a bunch of new customer incidents, and uh, one of my job is to uh, go through them to find to basically uh, find out uh, like which team get which incident and uh, for those things come to the analysis services engine team and uh, uh, it's my job to uh, look into the issues uh, and uh, assign to the right uh, engineers to resolve the issue. So over the years I noticed that, that the majority of the customer incidents are related to direct query models and the composite models. Uh, so uh, even though the majority of the actual uh, data models data models deployed uh, uh, into Power BI are actually import uh, data model, that basically says uh, uh, the import models actually have a lot of uh, fewer confusions to the users. So despite the number of uh, uh, customer incidents uh, to, related to direct query and composite models, they end up uh, uh, mostly being uh, just answer customer questions instead of uh, actually fixing a product defect. There are actually very few product defects coming out of those uh, customer incidents. The vast majority of them is because uh, the authors of the models are confused by some of the queries they saw, especially since they are most likely SQL experts, right? And uh, 
Well, here by direct query and compensated model, I'm not only talking about the direct query to uh, analysis services. I'm talking about direct query in general. And uh, actually, most of the questions are still coming from direct query to relational databases. And uh, uh, many of those people are very uh, well versed in SQL. Uh, they understand what the visual produce. So they, they, in their mind, they think what the SQL queries uh, should look like, but uh, sometimes uh, they were surprised. So they sent the incidents to me uh, to answer some of the questions. And uh, uh, so today I want to uh, use this opportunity to explain that uh, actually the visual generated the DAX query has a very different uh, semantics uh, from a, a SQL query that uh, uh, returned the same result set. So uh, when, once you understand that, you will understand why uh, you are uh, 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 seeing some of those issues uh, uh, those uh, users are uh, basically reported uh, when they build a uh, direct query and uh, compensate models. So once we understand this thing and understand the, the, the basically uh, 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 when some of the potential issues as a result of the DAX uh, uh, query semantics, then you, sh you, you can just learn some high level uh, advice. I I'm, I'm gonna give some high level advice about uh, the things you should pay attention to uh, when you build uh, such models. Uh, I'll do that in the end. Okay, so uh, before I get started, jump into the uh, the, uh, uh, the the heavy stuff. Let me first show you uh, the demos of uh, uh, some of the customer uh, issues that they have reported. Uh, of course, I'm not going to use the real customer data. I have uh, simplified and uh, uh, abstracted the, the, the basically the customer incidents and the use of Microsoft demo data to show you some of the issues. Uh, so let me go to, so I'm going to show you four demos. It's a lot, but uh, actually each one is quite small. I just want to show you uh, like a different uh, aspects of some of the problems uh, often hit by those users. The first one, okay, so this is a very simple uh, model. It only have a single table and uh, you can tell that uh, this is a direct query table and actually it's a direct query to a SAP HANA database. Okay. So uh, the, the visual, there's only a single visual here, it's a matrix, and uh, on this matrix, there uh, the color column is on the rows, and uh, the year column is on the column, and then there is some simple uh, count uh, of item uh, uh, calculation in the middle. So it's a very, very simple uh, uh, visual, and uh, the customer question is this, uh, if I by the way, I have attached uh, a SQL Server provider to it uh, to show you the queries, uh, the SQL, both the DAX query and the SQL query uh, triggered by this bureau. So let me go to Performance Analyzer so I can just uh, use it just to refresh the bureau. Uh, it's done. And uh, the question from the customer is, how come for, uh, you can see the, okay, let me make it bigger. So you can see that uh, there is a single uh, query begin, query end. This query begin and query end correspond to the DAX query generated by the matrix. And then there are four SQL queries. The user says, well, how come there are four? Because if you look at the bureau itself, people would think that, uh, yeah, you should uh, uh, basically do a select of the color column, the, the the year column and then some of this uh, count or count of something grew by the color and the year. That's how would you write the SQL query. And then once you get all these uh, numbers uh, in the middle uh, for the uh, uh, for the column totals, you just add up all these numbers across this uh, uh, this row and to get this number across the next row to get this number for all the uh, row subtotals, you can simply add up uh, the numbers across the first column to get the, this first subtotal, the second column against the same subtotal, and then after you get all the row subtotals and column subtotals, you can just add up all the uh, these numbers in this uh, small rectangle to get the grand total. So a single query should be sufficient. How come we have uh, four queries? 
uh, uh, actually, we see four SQL queries, one, two, three, four, there are different ones. We're not, uh, we don't have time to look at the exact query. And so that's what the customer's question about. Uh, so I'm going to explain in more details later on, but the, the short answer is because uh, SAP HANA, like uh, analysis services, has uh, measures. So it's not like any uh, relational database. That's the biggest difference between relational database and the multi-dimensional databases. That in addition to tables, columns, uh, uh, multi-dimensional databases have uh, measures, a very powerful concept. Uh, so in this case, uh, this uh, uh, calculation, uh, uh, let me get rid of this. This calculation uh, in the middle is done by HANA as a measure. Uh, so that's the main reason. Uh, that's, quite, uh, that's the first demo. Let me show you. So. Let me show you the second demo. The second demo is also a direct query uh, database. As you can see, uh, by the blue line at the top of each table, you can see they all come from the same database. If I hover over any one of them, you can say this is a direct query uh, to a, a SQL Server database. Okay. So once we have this, uh, here is the issue. Again, is uh, the user has uh, set up some slicers to uh, uh, to set some filters, and then there's a very simple uh, table uh, uh, in the middle, and then uh, the, the, the table has one column, which is the uh, online sales key. Uh, and by the way, I'm using the Contoso database. It's a sample database by Microsoft. So, so I have a simple measure I've added. This measure, if you look at the definition, Uh, it's a it's a simple sum of the sales amount column. Uh, nothing fancy here. But uh, this is not the actually the user's uh, uh, real measure. The second measure, the M two, if you look at the, the the definition of it, the the measure two is what the user's uh, uh, real measure is. Uh, it, the logic is very simple. So basically, uh, obviously, this is an a international company, so uh, it can do transactions uh, in different countries. So the uh, so many of these uh, sales amount are in the local currency, and without the currency conversion, so the user says you can only do a sum of the sales amount if a single current currency has been selected. So the actual uh, expression written by the user is uh, uh, if there is a single currency, then do the sales amount, sum of sales amount. Otherwise, raise an error saying you must select a single currency. And it's a very reasonable measure. But if the user added this measure to the report, which should re uh, return exactly the same number because I did uh, uh, select a single currency US dollar right down here. So I already did that part. So it should return exactly the same values as M1 in this small table. So let's say if I add it to here, First of all, you notice that it becomes much slower, and then the whole uh, 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 query errored out. And if I uh, see the error message, uh, many direct query users have seen this one. Oh, uh, you have exceeded the, the allowed size of 1 million rows. So this is that famous uh, 1 million row error for uh, direct query tables. But it's very confusing. The, obviously, the final result is uh, very small, and uh, obviously, the user has already selected a single currency. Why should and, uh, the user uh, know beforehand that uh, to put enough filters on it to avoid uh, a larger uh, result set? How come we still get this one million rows? And oh, why do I click on it and go to a different port? Okay, so uh, as it turns out, again, Today, I'm not, we don't have time to uh, look into individual uh, calculations and the individual query replies. Mm -hmm. All I can say is because this error function, use this one, makes this a more complex measure. Okay? And by complex measure, later on, I'm going to explain why complex measure can cause uh, issues like this. So if I uh, answer like this, my solution to the user is uh, don't use the error function in that particular case. And actually, it's a bad idea to use error functions in DAX calculations in general. You should use it very uh, carefully. It can cause performance issues in general. So the workaround, of course, is not as ideal as the original user's solution. Yes, uh, uh, instead of raising an error, you, you said, uh, you say, uh, 
if has uh, if has selected a single currency, do the sum of sales amount. Otherwise, just return blank. If we do that, I can add this uh, measure to the report, and then it should return the same result. Say it returns exactly the same result as a simple sum. Right? So I do put in the safety guard has a single value in this so that it will not sum of sales amount across multiple currencies, which doesn't make any sense. But uh, we, uh, we no longer have the one million euro errors in this case. That's the second demo. The next demo, uh, again, is uh, this one. This time I have a composite model, okay? By the blue color, the line on the top, so I only have three tables. I have a one transaction table called online sales, and uh, it's uh, filtered by a customer table. And then in the middle, the customer table is uh, filtered by the geography table on the left. So the filters flow from the geography table toward the customer table, toward the online sales table. And uh, the, in this case, because it's a composite model, so if I hover over the blue, line the tables they are direct query tables so the customer table and the online sales table are direct query tables and the, the geography table is an import table right so in this case the customer has also set up a, a low level security so the low level security uh, for simulation is very simple i just uh, on the imported uh, geography table i just uh, set a filter to uh, con uh, region country name equals region country name equals United States. So basically, whoever is subject to this security role can only see uh, sales data in the United States. So uh, go to the report, and in this report, you can see that uh, the I have a, a slicer on the left. It's, a, it's the yearly income column from the customer table. So uh, we have uh, basically narrowed down a small segment of customers uh, with a low income, okay, $10,000 and uh, the income. And then the, uh, there's a line chart here. The line chart only has two columns. One is the date. So basically uh, from the, uh, the sales table, the online sales table. So I'm simply showing the sum of sales amount over time. Okay, for this uh, for this income level the customers, it's a very very simple thing. And then now, if I turn on low level security, all I should get uh, is uh, is basically the the sales in the United States over time for uh, the for this uh, uh, income level uh, customers. Uh, I have attached a SQL Server provider to it. Later on, we're going to see what the SQL queries are generated when we turn on role level security. So I go back here. Uh, uh, actually, no, before I do that, let me first just refresh this as is so we can see without the role level security what queries are sent. Mm -hmm. So let me go to the performance analyzer and just to refresh the videos. So th there will be two separate queries, one for the uh, slicer and the one for the, uh, the line chart itself. So let's wait for them to finish. Okay, they are finished. And if I go back to uh, the uh, SQL Server provider, you will see two query begins, uh, one for the slicer, one for the uh, line chart, and then two direct queries which are the two SQL queries we send to the backend relational database. So far, so good. Nothing uh, nothing uh, special here. And now I turn around low level security. And I can go here. Oh, I have to go to model and view us, uh, United States. So I'm simulating uh, a low level security uh, filter to the United States. Okay, so you can see, yes, the, the chart does change. So we are filtered down to a single country. Now let's look at the, from the profiler to see 
the queries. Remember, the first two query begin are uh, before I uh, turn on row level security. So I have a two query end. So at this point, uh, this is uh, before I turn on row, row level security. And now I have a two uh, additional query begin because they are the row level securities. And then I have uh, instead of uh, uh, previously two direct query, which are the two SQL queries, we send one, two, three SQL queries. Uh, and uh, the first one is uh, still the slicer query. There's no surprise mm -hmm. there. And uh, how come I get uh, two uh, SQL queries instead of one? And, the, and of course, in the case of the customer's database, uh, uh, both queries are going over the large uh, transaction table, which is very slow and expensive. And also, it's a totally unexpected. You, I'm just turning on a filter. How come uh, I'm suddenly getting a lot more uh, 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 to, to one more, one extra query, and then not only that, if you look at the query itself, the first query, actually I should have prepared ahead of time, and if I go to uh, a better, a better place so I can see what I can, I can just uh, uh, paste this query here. I just, I then, just want to say I love that it's called poor SQL. <laughs> It's a great, great website name. Yeah, it's a very modest uh, website, but it's a very powerful uh, beautifier. There are lots of uh, SQL beautifiers out there. This is one of our favorites. Mm -hmm. right? So you can say that uh, this this particular query is trying to get all the data values, which is the, the axis of the line chart. And then uh, forget about the from class. Uh, it's just go to the right table, and then it's trying. It has a aware clause on the geography key. Remember, the filter is on United States, right? So I said the United States, and uh, and then you can see that the filter here is on geography key, and then do I see anything else? There's nothing else. So I'm finding uh, effectively. Uh, it's understandable why the where clause is on the geography key because if we, if we go back to the model, we know that uh, uh, even though the filter is on this table on the country column, even though the filter itself is a low cardinality, but because the data here is imported, but the, the table it filters is in the remote uh, uh, relational database and which does not have the geography table, so I cannot send the the filters as a simple like a country equals United States to the, the remote database. It doesn't have, doesn't have this table. So the filter is uh, translated into a column on this side. And the closest the column on this side is whether the relationship is on, that is the geography key. So if I uh, make this a little bit bigger and hover over the relationship, you can tell that uh, the two tables are connected by the geography key column. So the filter on the this table has to be translated into a filter on the geography column uh, in order to be able to filter the uh, the remote uh, uh, SQL server side. Uh, so that is understandable, but and uh, eventually the geography key will be used to filter down to the date uh, column, which is here. I believe the date column is here. And uh, what, what uh, the, if we go to the visual, it's easier to say. If I go to the line chart and hover over the date key, uh, it is uh, on the online sales table. Okay. So uh, the first the thing is it scales. It, uh, the the first query is to scan the transaction table, applying the low level security, which is uh, find the, all the customer, all the all the geography keys inside the United States, and then. Uh, I use that as a filter to find all the dates that has a sales in the United States. Uh, since I'm scanning the fact table, that's a very slow. I'm also returning a large number of dates because there are lots of uh, uh, transactions that happen all over the different days in the United States. But how come I'm not applying this filter here? Because I do have the customer filter saying I'm limiting to only those customers in this particular income bracket. How come I'm not uh, uh, seeing that filter to uh, greatly narrow down the the number of the, the 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 number of dates that have sales? Actually, in the case of the real customer, they may hit that one million row, 
error already because uh, obviously if you don't apply uh, this uh, much more selective income level uh, to restrict the, the, the number of transactions, you may end up having a lot more days. That, uh, any days that uh, has a, uh, transactions in the United States, it will be returned. You will likely, uh, for a larger sales table, you will likely hit that one million euro error already. Right? So uh, if I go back to the uh, so this is the first query. If I look at the second query, uh, again, go to the very modest the poor SQL <laughs> and paste in the new query. Even the website's like, all right, that's a pretty big query. Give me, give me a minute to, to format it. I know, I know. Yeah, that's another indication that uh, uh, you have to be very careful when you build the composite models. Uh, mm -hmm. the, you, as you can tell, the, the, uh, the query we generated are very big. So while we're waiting for this, hopefully it's coming back, and uh, the, 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 the key here, we need to, uh, maybe it's not, so, oh, okay, actually it finally come back. So this one does have the, uh, the date key, which is the access under the sum. So it does have, a, it does look like the correct query to populate the line chart. And then if I look at the where, the, the most important thing is the where clause. The where clause is I do have the income level now, right? So I have a filter on the income level equals uh, this bracket. And then I still have the geography key to limit the number of, uh, uh, the, basically the geographies uh, within the United States. And in addition to both of them, if you look further down, it has this huge uh, where clause on the date key. This is most likely to get all the dates coming from the first query. Remember, the first query is to get a list of dates. And then the second query, uh, in the where clause, uh, I have a, a filter on the uh, geography, geography key, that's understandable. I have a filter on the income level, that's what the user said. And I also have a, a filter on the date key, which is most likely the result of the first query. Mm -hmm. This is a, a very bad, okay? So by, uh, before you turn on role level security, everything looks fine. But the, the moment you turn on role level security, uh, you, uh, you, you may hit the 1 million row error because of the first query is ignoring the user filters here and uh, in the actual report. So, uh, so this is uh, another issue. So the, the, my last demo. And I just right want to just, just mention on that, just kind of as a, as a takeaway, like I've noticed multiple times, um, where a model, uh, is built properly and it, and it works just fine until role of a security hits a certain scenario where rows are missing between tables and a connection can no longer be made. Or in your case, you it hit a performance issue. But I think it, it's it's good to thoroughly test role of a security, um, both in desktop and in the service uh, as, a, as a few different users to make sure that the model uh, actually works well um, across different scenarios. Because there, there's a lot of gotchas that you will not find until that's turned on essentially and then you uh you you run a test environment with it that's an excellent point actually that's exactly one of the advice i'm going to give uh, at the end of this mm -hmm. and uh, yeah and that's a very excellent point so uh my last demo here is uh, again the schema is uh, similar to the previous one with one difference again this is a composite model and uh, uh, i have a uh, uh, the online, again, the same three tables, uh, geography table on the left, filters the customer table in the middle, filters the online sales table on the right. And uh, the only, the main difference between uh, this one and the previous one is uh, uh, the middle table, the customer table in the previous case is a direct query, but uh, in this case is import. So in the previous case is a two direct query and the one import in this case is a two import and the one direct query. So the, both the geography table and the customer table are import. Uh, only the online sales table is the direct query. So once again, the user has uh, defined the uh, uh, role level security in the United States. Uh, and the role level security is, again, is the filter on the geography table saying country name equals United States. So come back here. So uh, uh, here I have a very simple table. Uh, in this table table, again, yes, I'm showing, uh, again, same thing, but I'm, instead of using a line chart, I'm using a table to show that uh, for the date key and you show the sales amount uh, right here. Right? And I don't have any filters in this case, so it's a different problem from the previous one. 
uh, I have uh, attached the SQL Server provider uh, right here. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first turn around uh, low level security. And I'm going here. I'm going to view us United States. So, uh, so instead of uh, uh, sales amount over time, this will be sales amount over time in the United States. Uh, you will see that uh, you can see there's a spinning thing here. It's taking its time. So it's a slow query. We have to be a little bit patient. Okay, it's done here. Okay. The user's question is, okay, he, he got it. And uh, in the user's uh, actual incident, uh, this table has a lot of other columns. Okay. But the user noticed a very strange thing. And uh, it's very slow, but it's okay. But when the user add another column, also from the online sales table to this report, uh, let's say, which is the foreign key column that are joined with the customer table and uh, the relationship is going through the customer key column. So the user noticed that if he uh, included the customer key column uh, also in the report, uh, let's first wait for it to finish. This time it will return a lot more rows, obviously. Uh, previously, we are aggregating to the data level. Now we are aggregating to different data and a different customer. Okay, so it's done. Uh, and uh, the user's question is this, if I look at the SQL query generated, and uh, remember, this is the first one that is uh, uh, only uh, returned the date and the sum of cells. You notice that it has uh, two direct queries to scanning of this table. But the second one with one extra column, the data key and the customer key, you only have a single query. And in the user's case, because again, yes, uh, uh, these queries are hitting the large transaction table, they are very slow. So obviously, the user want to is curious, like how come in one case I'm 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 getting I'm scanning the table twice, and in the other case I'm scanning the table only once. So. And, and also, it's because you, you he only can see this behavior when you turn on low level security. Otherwise, you don't have this uh, behavior at all. So all these questions are very good questions. And uh, both in this case, in this demo, and the previous demo, uh, one of the things I want to I want to point out is uh, the column uh, in the report, the data key column, are uh, coming from the online sales table. So this is not exactly what we call a star schema where we want the dimension columns coming from dedicated or separated dimension tables in a star schema or snowflake uh, schema. Uh, uh, in this case, the one of the, uh, yes, they do have a separate customer table and a separate geography table. That part is good. It's a, it's a follow the uh, snowflake schema design, but the date column used in the report is coming directly from the transaction table. So this is a small deviation from the star schema or snowflake schema, dimensional modeling design is the fundamental reason that we're, we're seeing these issues. All right. So we have seen four demos today and all of them pointing to that uh, uh, you are gonna, uh, uh, basically the similar issues actually happen, uh, can also happen in all import models but uh, they tend to be exacerbated a lot more over direct query models and the composite models because the backend uh, query can be a lot slower than uh, the vertibag engine queries. So any of this like a uh, extra query thing can become much more uh, magnified uh, to uh, uh, damaging the performance, to degrade the performance than compared to uh, all import models. So to understand that all these uh, strange behaviors users have observed, we need to actually jump into the semantics of uh, uh, Power BI queries. To, and uh, so let me just uh, say uh, for any Power BI query, say let, let's, let's, let's look at what the Power BI queries look like. First, let's look at an example. Okay? So this is one of the Gartner demo uh, uh, report built by uh, one of our PMs. So if I, uh, I already attached the SQL Server provider so I can catch the next queries generated by this vector, by this, uh, by this report. But regardless of this, like a, uh, like a very uh, complicated, very fancy, like a fully dynamic report, everything. In the end, uh, uh, the DAX queries are uh, following a very uh, specific pattern. So um, let, let me go back to the performance analyzer to re-trigger the queries. 
Okay, uh, let's wait for them to finish. Okay, so we have uh, finished a bunch of queries. Let me go to the SQL Server provider. So there are uh, several queries, one for each zero, right? So you have a query here, a query here, a query here, and a query here. So we have uh, quite a few queries in different places, right? So let me just grab a, a random one. Let's say this one. Let me copy it out. Let's take a look at what this query looks like, okay? And, uh, so, so uh, actually, let me first uh, scroll to the top. So it's a pretty long query, okay? So uh, uh, you have uh, a define, a define a bunch of variables. So you can see the query is built up in multiple steps, right? And I scroll down all the way to the end. So it's very, uh, it's a pretty big query. But for every DAX query, uh, typically the problems happens in a, a, a particular step, which is uh, to get the core result. And how do you know which one is the, getting the core result? Conveniently, uh, we have all these variables to naming the steps. And the one of the variables, there's only one such variable, is called uh, has the has the word core in it. So this actually is the core query of uh, all the DAX queries. So uh, if you want to rep, uh, rep, rep, uh, basically repro the issue, you want to focus on the core query. What's this? And if you look at this core query, it is uh, a simple summarize a columns of function call. Right? So in other words, uh, to understand all the performance issues or sometimes correct issues uh, in uh, the DAX query, you typically want to uh, 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 basically investigate the result of the core query. And the core query in the vast majority of complex queries will always be a summarize a columns function call. That's, uh, so that's enough demo. Let me go back to my uh, presentation, okay? So uh, in order to understand all the previous problems, we need to understand the summarize columns function. Uh, that is the primary function used by the core query of any arbitrarily complex text query. The summarize columns function takes a bunch of input parameters. They can be divided into three sections. The left section, is a list of columns. The middle section is a list of uh, filters. The right section is a list of uh, measures. So uh, despite it's a, a, like a scary name and uh, the long list of input parameters, it's actually uh, quite nicely divided into three simple sections. The first section is the columns section, okay? So what this section does is, it's a defining uh, like a, a SQL grouping set. SQL grouping size basically is uh, in a single query, you can return a union of uh, multiple uh, sub result set. Each one has its a, a distinct a group by clause, right? So that's a very typical uh, a BI query that uh, in addition to like, a, like a in the previous, uh, in the first demo in a matrix, then you want to group by color and year and you want to group by color alone. You want to group by year alone. And then you want the grand total, which is grouped by nothing. So uh, summarize columns also give you a similar function for you to define a diff multiple group by classes in a single result set. And then uh, for each particular granularity, by granularity, I mean a specific group by class, this is how uh, the summarize columns uh, function is supposed to work. So you can have a list of columns. We will say for all the columns from the same table, we apply uh, what we call an auto exist semantics. That sounds scary, but it's a simply saying it's a, uh, what a, uh, the DAX engine is going to do is equivalent to this. Uh, uh, where is my cursor? Let me find out. Okay, my cursor is here. So what the DAX engine is going to do is do something very similar to this SQL statement. I'm just selecting all these columns from this table. And actually, I'm selecting from this table, I'm also grouping by it, okay? So that is what we call the auto exist semantics. Uh, sounds fancy, but it's actually quite simple. But for columns from different tables, we have a cross-join semantics. What do I mean by that? And it's similar to this. 
uh, it's similar to this uh, SQL statement. I'm, uh, by, by the way, uh, I'm, I, I, in order to make this small, I just uh, not have the group by. Uh, in the case of uh, the, uh, the summarized columns, uh, we always do group by. We don't do pure select. We group by all those columns. Okay. So, uh, in, uh, so assuming that I have uh, columns from uh, three different uh, tables. So, uh, what uh, the DAX engine is going to do in this case is it's going to select all those columns from these uh, three tables joined together. You will notice that I don't use on clause here, and uh, that is on purpose because uh, without on clause. You are, and uh, you are having a cross join. That's what I mean by cross join semantics. You will notice that the relationships defined in the model don't apply to here at all. That is also very surprising to the uh, the uh, to the people. So uh, uh, the column sections, in summary, column sections define multiple group by classes. We call them multiple granularities, just like a SQL grouping sets. Uh, columns from the same table have auto exist uh, behavior, and the columns from different tables has a cross join uh, behavior. Next section is the filters section. So the filters section again a list of filters. In that in the summarized columns, every filter is a DAX table expression. DAX is a very feature-rich language. You can define arbitrary filters. All of them can be used as a, a filter expression inside the summarized columns. Okay, but uh, uh, any DAX expressions can return uh, uh, many columns. Okay, so uh, DAX engine will differentiate between what we call the model columns and the extension columns. By model columns, we simply mean the columns already exist in the in the model schema. So all the all the columns in there, what we call a model columns. They, the, the columns already exist in the original model. The extension columns are new columns uh, produced by the DAX expression. For example, uh, if I use the DAX summarize uh, function, it's a, it is a table function. It also has a, uh, basically the input parameters can also be divided into three parts. The first argument is a table. So I'm saying I'm scanning this table. I'm uh, grouping by all these columns from this table, and then I'm adding some uh, additional expressions, typically aggreg aggregations, uh, summarizations of some other columns uh, in the table. And uh, and uh, so from the DAX engine perspective, uh, this middle section, all the columns, the C1, C2, all the way to CM, is what we call the model columns because they exist in the original model. And then all the new columns added by summarize function on the right section, uh, we call them extension columns. Okay. So uh, from the filter perspective, uh, the result of this uh, summarize, you can think about it as an intermediate table. Only the model columns participate in the filter operation. The extension columns are ignored by the filter context. So once we have all the filters, how are filters uh, actually applied? In DAX, the filter applies to a, a leaf level table scan and that, that where well, I'm not going to that into the filter context, the row context today. I'm assuming the audience here already uh, uh, have heard about the, the filter context and how DAX filters work uh, to measures. But from the SQL perspective, uh, the every filter just applies a SQL semi-join operation. Since a SQL does not have an explicit semi-join uh, operator, and uh, many people say the SQL semi-join can be uh, implemented using the SQL exists class. So, so uh, actually, uh, so here uh, uh, I'm scanning a table. Uh, I just call it a table, okay, and. Uh, Oh, uh, give me a moment. So I'm scanning this table. And, uh, a, uh, uh, just a quick question, um, just on a, uh, one of the, the viewers was uh, wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit on semi-join. Mm -hmm. Okay, semi-join is uh, basically uh, table one, semi-join with table two in the relational algebra means uh, for each row in table one, uh, uh, you try to find at least one matching row in table two. If there is at least one matching row in table two, you will uh, return that row. Otherwise, you will drop that row. 
So that's a semi join. Perfect. So you. you can think about the semi join is like a generalized filter operation. So the basic filter operation is a where clause, and uh, it's typically where some values equal something. And but if I have a filter table on the side, then the filter table's effect on the uh, on the primary table is uh, if you uh, try to find the matching rows on the join columns uh, through the join columns. Okay. So and uh, another way to think about the semi join is is the exist clause of a relational. Uh, 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 algebra uh, of the SQL uh, syntax. So I'm uh, basically selecting some columns uh, from the uh, from the primary table, the table, okay? And then I'm only gonna return a row if this exists clause uh, 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 returns true. And the exists clause is simply saying, uh, I, I, I want to find any row uh, in the filter table such that the join columns, here the B columns are the basically the uh, the join columns between the two tables and the A columns are the output co output columns are from the primary table. So in the case of the semi-join, remember uh, T1 semi-join with T2, uh, only the columns from T1 will be in the final output. So the T2, the second table, is only used as a filter purpose. Okay? So here, the second table, the filter table, is only used to uh, filter the T1 table. There's no columns from this table contribute to the output. So that's what the semi join is in uh, in SQL. Okay. So uh, in a more uh, complex scenario, which I'm not going into today, that uh, sometimes, of course, you can have uh, filters that uh, uh, in, includes columns from uh, multiple tables, not only from a single table. Then in that case, the auto exist semantics will be extended beyond a single table, but uh, it will be very similar to uh, a single table case. So I'm not going to go into the details there. And so uh, for today's purpose, let's just uh, understand that uh, columns from the same table, not only columns, and now we have introduced the filters. Okay, so columns and the filters from the same table will form the auto exist uh, uh, semantics, and uh, from uh, uh, columns from different tables will have a cross join semantics. The last section of summary columns are a list of uh, measures. Uh, so measures are the biggest uh, invention of uh, uh, multi-dimensional databases. They are fundamentally different from uh, relational databases. So uh, one of the big thing about measures is you don't have to uh, uh, put the entire measure expression inside any query. So the query only refer to measure, measures by their names. The definition, the method, the complex logic, no matter how big it is, are saved inside the database itself. And uh, but uh, the measures can produce can magically produce a correct results for any query coming in. That's actually quite quite magical and is one of the uh, primary uh, re reasons why people are attracted by uh, the multi-dimensional databases such as, such as uh, the analysis of services database. You can predefine calculations safely in the database. It will just magically work against any future report that the major authors don't even know what they will be. Uh, so uh, in summarized columns, you can have uh, as many measures as you want, but they are all semantically independent of each other. This is quite a surprising to many people. Let's say I added two measures. The first measure, let's say, is a sum of sales. And then the second measure is a sum of sales at times 1.1. So I'm just incrementing by 10%. I can even say measure one times 1.1. Uh, uh, so for many people, they can see two columns of numbers. The first column is the original sum. The second one is the number on the left times 1.1. So there's a clear dependency between the two. But semantically, they are all independent of each other. In other words, when, I, when DAX engine look at the second measure, it does not need to know anything about the first measure. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's the actual execution strategy. I'm saying that's the semantics. Uh, of this thing. So you don't need to know. Every measure is calculated independent of each other. They don't they, they don't depend on each other directly, okay, uh, through the results. Okay. And also summarized columns uh, uh, have a, a implicit what I call a non-empty filter. What, what does it mean is uh, uh, once you calculated all the measure values, summarized columns will return will throw that row away if uh, all the measure values are blacks. Blanks are also nulls uh, in relational uh, in, in SQL terms, but uh, 
the the the, the DAX blanks have a slightly different uh, meaning from the uh, relational nouns. So, but uh, in, in in today's presentation, they can be uh, considered kind of like equivalent. Okay? So, but this measures this non uh, empty filter only applies to measure the regular measures. Okay, so uh, in the summarized columns function, some measures just put by their names. Uh, the other measures you can wrap them in the ignore function. I can just call them ignored measures. The ignored measures don't participate in this non-empty filter. Okay, so now that we understand the three sections of a summarized columns uh, uh, function, let's look at a concrete example. Here, uh, I have a summarized column uh, function in the, uh, uh, I have a single summarized columns function right here. Okay. And uh, it has uh, uh, two uh, uh, columns, uh, product, the product name, and the customer full name. Okay. And the two filters, filter one, filter two are defined here. The, fil the first filter is on the date year column, the second filter is on the product color column. So I have a two uh, columns and the two filters and the two measures. In this case, the two measures, one of uh, they are always on the sales table. And the first measure is a sum of a sales amount column. The second measure is a sum of a order quantity column. So uh, even though this is uh, quite a lot of text, but it's a single summarized uh, columns uh, function and uh, the, the first section, the columns section, defines uh, three granularities. Group by both product name and the customer full name, group by product name only, and the group by nothing, which is the grand total. Okay? So this particular case, I have defined the three uh, uh, group by classes uh, in a single result set. I have applied the two filters and I have a calculate, I'm, I'm going to calculate the two measures. You notice that, that the order by class is outside summarize columns function. Therefore, uh, you never see DAX engine push the order by class. What I wouldn't say never, you rarely see DAX engine push order by class uh, into the underlying uh, relational database. The, the, this is the reason because uh, the summarized the order by is outside the, the summarized columns function, where the summarized column, column columns function itself is the core function of uh, every DAX uh, uh, engine. So uh, let's go to the next one. Okay, so now let's uh, think about uh, how summarized columns. Uh, actually works. Now that we understand the input parameters, so how it actually works. Uh, I'm going to use the previous question. Uh, I'm going back and forth between uh, this uh, middle section, which is the, uh, the, the uh, how how this uh, function is, the, the semantics of this function, and I'm using the previous query as an actual example. First, it, I would say for each granularity, which means for each group by class of the grouping sets, as I said, we have a three granularities, right? Uh, we have the group by both product name and the customer full name, group by product name alone, and the group by nothing, the grand total. So, okay. So for each granularity, I'm going to do the following section. First, I'm going to uh, join all the columns and the filters from the same table. That's, and then uh, I'm going to cross join uh, all the columns from different tables. So go back to this example. Uh, I have uh, uh, two, tables involved. One is the product table. So I'm going to group by the product name column. Uh, I'm going to find all the distinct group by names, but I also have a filter. I'm going to put them together into a single uh, auto exist cluster. So I'm going to say, find uh, all the distinct product names uh, uh, for the blue colored products. All right. So that's the first uh, in term, you can think about everyone. This is what we call a dimension query. This dimension query will produce a intermediate table okay and then i'm going to group by all the customer full names i'm going to find the distinct values of the customer full types that's another small table because i happen to have no filter applied to the customer table here and the date year is a pure filter so it does not participate in the output so we just leave it alone uh, there and come back here okay so i'm going to find the cross drawing of the previous two dimension queries so I'm going to find the cross drawing of all the blue colored product names and all the customer names. 
Once we have that cross join, you can think about it as another intermediate table, which is a cross join. And then for each row in that cross join, I'm going to do the following. And, uh, and uh, for each regular measure, in this case, both measures are regular measure. I'm not using ignore. So uh, for each reg and uh, but I have two measures. So for the first measure, which is sum of sales amount, I'm going to evaluate that for the current row. Uh, so in this case, I'm saying that uh, for a particular product and a particular customer name, I'm going to calculate the sum of a sales amount. And in order to do that, I'm going to say select the sum of sales amount from the sales table, join with the product table, join with the customer table, join with the data table, where the customer, the product name is equal to the current product name in that row. The customer full name is going to equal to the, the current value of the customer full name in that row. Remember, I'm in a particular row. And then uh, now is the time to apply this filter where the year is uh, 2008 or 2009. And then I will return a single sales amount of value. So I do that for the first measure. I do exactly the same thing for the second measure. The second measure is a sum of a water quantity. So I'm saying I'm going to sum of a, the water quantity column from the sales table again, and then uh, uh, join with the product table, the customer table, the date table, uh, again, in order to apply the three filters, right? On the product name, the customer full name, the product color, and the, the, the year. Uh, we apply those filters to get another number. Once we get both numbers, I'm going to check if both numbers are null or not. If so, then I'm going to skip it. Otherwise, I'm going to keep this row. I don't have any non-zero filters we don't have to worry about today. I don't have any ignore measures we don't have to worry about it today. And then I'm going to return that row if the non-empty filter does not eliminate that. I do this, and then I go back to this loop. I go to the next row, repeat the same process. And once I finish every single row in this cross join, I go back to the outer loop, which I go to the next group by clause and, and repeat the process. And in this case, the next group by clause is group by the product name only. So in this case, I'm gonna only have auto exist, but I don't have it because now I wanna have a single table now. So which is the, 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 the product table. So I'm gonna find all the distinct product names uh, corresponding to the blue color. It's an intermediate result. And then I no longer have a cross drawing, but I have a single table. I will go over row by row for each product name. I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna first scan the sales table to get the sales amount for that product. And scan the sales table again for the sum of water quantity for that product. And then I come back here, I uh, apply the non filter. If both are blank, throw it away. Otherwise, keep the row. And then I finish all the rows. And finally, I go back to the next uh, group by uh, granularity, which is uh, the grand total one, and then repeat the whole uh, the process again. Uh, so that is the semantics of summarized columns. Uh, so you can tell this is uh, completely different from a SQL select statement, even though for any people who understand the uh, uh, SQL select statement, uh, what you'll be writing in the SQL is uh, select uh, 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 the product name and the customer full name from uh, sales table join with product name, uh, product table join with customer table join with the date table where uh, product color equals blue and the uh, date year uh, in 2008 or 2009 and then group by uh, the uh, product name and the full name. Right, that that is the SQL uh, statement that you are gonna uh, uh, write in order to produce exactly the same output uh, as the summarized columns. But that's not the semantics. I'm not saying this is not the execution of uh, summarized columns. I'm saying this is not the semantics of summarized columns. Okay, but why do we have such a, a semantics? It's because, as we said. Measures is the greatest thing in Power BI, and uh, measures are uh, the reason you can write arbitrarily complex logic, and it doesn't magically work. In any case, it's exactly because of this this particular step, where for each measure, you're just uh, so. Despite the big query we, we just saw uh, in here. Despite this a real super long query, we said you only need to worry about the summarized columns. And then for the summarized columns, eventually it just comes down to setting a bunch of filters on columns. So in this case, 
regardless what the measure expression is, I'm, I, I happen to have a, a simple measure expression here, but I may have a really complex expressions there. It still will work because when it comes to evaluate the measures, it all uh, the DAX engine will simplify uh, from the conceptual model, we simplify it down to a filter on the product name, a filter on the customer full name, a filter on the year column, and a filter on the color. And that's all there is. So in other words, measure authors only need to think about a bunch of filters set up by whatever the query is, regardless of what the visual does. And the measure authors, their mental model is simplified down to a bunch of filters set on some model columns. That's all there is. And then you can just go from there to write your generic measure that can be added to any report. So this simplicity, the semantic model is a key to why uh, is a, a, despite this abstract nature of measures, is still actually quite doable for us humans. Of course, uh, people say, uh, uh, SQL is a, a declarative uh, uh, query language because it does not specify uh, the execution strategy. Actually, if a SQL is a declarative uh, uh, pro, uh, query language, DAX is uh, 10 times the declarative uh, uh, query language because if you literally follow this script to execute a query, it will take forever for a majority of uh, real world scenarios. Right, you just cannot do it this way. Okay. Well, there, there's so, the term, uh, the, the term that I love that I, I think Mark and Alberto came up with. It. It's syntax sugar. You know, it's the being able to write something that then translates into much more complex code, but it's easy for no. for users to describe. Yeah, yeah, and it's also easy for our UI to generate. Think about this. And how do I generate a SQL query uh, if I build such a UI? It will be super complex, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. in the SQL, you cannot refer to calculations by names. You have to put the full expression in there. You have to hook it up with uh, uh, all the outside uh, uh, columns that the user have added to the report. Uh, the, the, just the query generation alone will greatly slow down. So this, exactly. uh, uh, this declarative nature of uh, DAX queries is also key to uh, enable Power BI uh, uh, UIs to generate the queries uh, super fast. <laughs> and uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, the semantics is, uh, as we already mentioned, the semantics is quite different from a SQL select statement. Okay? Well, I think so th this what... last part, I think, is just uh does a great job of, you know, because a lot of people have asked, like, you know, what's the difference between this and SQL, you know, and, and with the declarative conversation, I really do think it shows a, a, a huge primary differences between the two and, and why they're, like, they're related, but they're also, they, they, they serve very different purposes. Yeah, that's a very good point. So, the, the reason why uh, the final query actually is a very reasonable, if I actually produce uh, that particular uh, DAX query and run it in the SQL Server Provider, you will see a SQL select statement uh, eventually translated into a single SQL select statement that is very similar to w what we just uh, described. Okay, so in order to achieve that, DAX engine has to do a ton of optimizations. Okay, so uh, uh, actually inside the DAX engine, we have a lot more uh, optimizations than what's listed here. I'm just going to mention a few important ones for in the context of that previous query to explain how uh, actually things actually eventually worked out. Okay, so the first one, we, uh, many of these terminologies are internal terminology used by the engine team, so they are not for like an external like a marketing purpose. So they, they don't have those like marketing, uh, the fancy needs of those terms. One is called a block mode optimization. What it does is, uh, and uh, the, 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 the first thing is, is uh, it's insane to do this row by row. That's just not, that's just a stupid. Okay, so what the DAX engine actually does, it, it scans the, uh, the, the sales table just once. Okay, and, uh, and then because it realized that eventually I'm gonna group by the, uh, the, the output column will be the, uh, the, the product name column and the mm -hmm. full name column. So what the DAX engine actually does is scan the fact table just once and group by the, uh, uh, the, those two columns and to produce the sum. 
So this is called a block mode. And then when that row by row operations kicks in, it's actually not scanning the sales table again and again. It's, we already pre-scanned the sales table for all these rows, and you just need to do a join. If you, you basically you look up into that uh, pre-scanned intermediate result, which is, if, which is similar to a SQL join operation. That's the block mode yep. and the sparse measures. That's a super important, as we said, the summarized columns has this implicit non-empty filter. That's a key. And this non-empty filter uh, in the context of this particular query means uh, uh, the cross join of the product name and the customer name is means we have to consider all the possible combinations of products and the customers. But in reality, each customer only purchase a small subsection of uh, products and each product is only purchased by a small number of a small percentage of customers. It's never going to be every customer purchase every product and every product is purchased by every customer. That's not uh, in real world. That's not the case. So a uh, DAX engine is and, and since uh, if you don't have a purchase, then the sum will be no. That is translated into blank in DAX engine, and this non-empty filter means I'm going to throw it away. So that means DAX is going to do analysis of measures to find out which measures are what we call sparse measures. And then and in, in, in this particular example, both some measures are very sparse. So once DAX engine realized that, DAX engine said, okay, I'm going to just... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just use a non empty filter by eliminating the cross join of the dimension tables completely. I'm not going to start from a cross join of the dimension tables and then scan this row by row. I'm just going to start from the, uh, the sales table and then group by those two uh, columns. And then eventually I'm going to join with those individual dimension query results. One is uh, the query on the uh, on the uh, the product table, the other one is on the custom table. So I completely eliminated this cross join. And once uh, DAX engine decided the measures are sparse, but it's very important that the measures must be sparse. For example, uh, in this particular report, if the customer wants to say, oh, uh, let's say, uh, well, in this case, it should not happen, but uh, let's say there are some other measures that uh, it has a value for a uh, sales amount, but uh, no value for order quantity. So some customers say, I don't want to see a blank value next to uh, in my report. I, I use the trick, say the plus zero trick, or use the if function, use one of those standard techniques to convert a blank value into zero. That's a big uh, uh, a potential performance issue for you. By, by adding zero to an expression, you are converting all blanks to zeros. And then that means that the non-empty filter no longer applies. Because in that case, for the cross join of the product and the customer, you will have a non-blank value in all cases for the second measure. It will at least return a zero back when you don't have a sales. Right? So you are literally, by adding a zero to this sum, you are turning this measure into what we call a dense measure. Then that a sparse measure optimization can no, long, can no longer apply. Then you will have a cross drawing of the dimension tables. But that could be what you want, you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very dangerous thing to do. You have to be very careful with dense measures. Okay. Another optimization is called transfer constraints and the reduce semi joints. I already said that in the block mode, we already scanned the fact table. But the, remember, all the filters are on the dimension tables, right? So mm -hmm. this uh, optimization is saying, when I scan the fact table, I'm also going to join with the dimension table at the same time. Remember, this is not a cross join. This is just a, it can be an inner join. And then uh, I will also uh, apply all the filters on the dimension table to reduce this scan of the sales table. And the next one is called the fusion. We, un we have two measures here, and the DAX engine do a deep analysis find out that both measures are based on the sales table. It doesn't have to be. That's why measures are super flexible. I can have one measure on the sales uh, online sales table, another measure based on the retail sales table, and then I can put them in the same report. That's the power of using measures. But in the case of that, uh, in this case, both measures are from the same sales table, so I can combine them into a single scan. So, so 
This is the optimization what we call fusion. So I can combine multiple table scans into a, a single one by doing some deep analysis of measures to make sure that they have the same filters, they have the same Google classes, and then they are scanning the same table, of course. So what are the reasons, um, j just on the conversation of blanks, it's it's one of the reasons that I, I wish that there were, on like cards and other stuff, there was a toggle in the visual that just show blank as zero or something else like that. So you don't have to, to do a plus zero or put an if statement in the measure. I, I know that's been a requested feature on ideas for a while, but there, there definitely yes. can be dangers um, with trying to scrub out uh, blanks from the measure, depending on how it's written. Yeah, you, you, you have a very good point. So today, because we lack of that formatting feature, display mm -hmm. blank as a zero, many people are writing DAX, which is literally changing the query result. That's not what you actually typically want. What you really want is a whether read just describe just a formatting feature. Please display blank as a zero or some other, uh, like a, uh, whatever other things you want to display on the UI. Should It should be a pure UI feature, not a data query feature or absolutely not a calculation feature. Redundant join elimination is, uh, up, uh, as I said, we will we are already uh, smart enough to combine into a single sales table scan joined with some dimension uh, tables and uh, already combined the two measures into a single scan, but uh, we're still joining. I eliminated the cross join of the dimension tables, but uh, the sales table scan still need to join with the dimension tables. Right? So we still have to do the actual join. The redundant join elimination says, let's eliminate that join as well. So I'm no longer sending multiple uh, uh, SQL queries. So without this optimization, I would be sending one query to the product table, one query to the, uh, the customer table, one query to the sales table, join with the product table, join with the, uh, uh, the customer table. And once I get the three results sets back, the DAX engine has to do another join of the three result sets in order to produce the final output, the redundant join eliminations. That's eliminated the two dimension queries completely because the, the fact table query already did the join with the two relational tables. There's no need to do join with them again. The grouping sense is the last important optimization. As I already said, uh, this query has uh, three granularities. And the DAX engine look at the two measures saying, oh, you're doing a sum. So the result, uh, I, I only need to do a single query at the lowest bar, uh, lowest group by, which is a group by of the uh, both the product name and the uh, customer phone name, and then uh, the other two uh, 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 group classes can be derived directly from this uh, intermediate result set, right? Because if I'm doing a aggregation, uh, uh, basically subtotal of all uh, customers for each product, I can just do the sum locally myself because the measure itself is a sum, it's an additive. Uh, similarly, the, the grand total is also a sum uh, of uh, all the individual values. So because I can do that, I no longer need to send the three separate queries. But, uh, uh, the, the, but if it's a distinct count, for example, you cannot do, you cannot sum up distinct count, it produces a wrong result. Then in that case, DAX engine will generate uh, three separate queries, one per granularity. Remember our first demo where the user asked, how come in the, mat in the matrix, I, I'm, I'm sending four separate queries to SAP HANA? It's because the SAP HANA's measure can be either distinct count or some. DAX engine doesn't know. S engine doesn't know at all because it's completely inside the SAP HANA. So that's why we have to assume the worst that the measure is non-additive. So in that particular case, uh, this grouping sets optimization cannot kick in. So you end up sending four queries to the underlying. Uh, I understand we are way over time, but <laughs> we need to come to the final conclusion of uh, the, the slide. Uh, no and so, so, so now that we understand the, the semantics of uh, 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 the, the summarized columns, that's the core of any complex text query. We also understand that uh, the naive uh, semantics of it requires a very uh, expensive uh, uh, execution strategy. So it uh, takes a ton of uh, DAX engine optimizations in order to uh, uh, to eliminate those. But of course, optimizations are always just optimizations. They're not always, they're not in 100%. They are always, uh, if certain conditions are met, we can apply this optimization. Therefore, in some cases, those optimizations cannot kick in when we have to uh, do the slower execution strategy. So, uh, and, and uh, we always said that, that uh, 
this kind of a performance issues that are caused by certain important uh, optimizations cannot apply due to various reasons uh, and that can be exacerbated a lot by composite models or direct query models when the query engine is a lot slower than vertipack engine that has data locally. So the first advice when you to build a composite model is don't if you if you can avoid it. <laughs> so try to import data. Many people don't want to do uh, import model. Uh, well, you have good reasons because the data doesn't fit, then you don't have a choice. And there's also reason like uh, think about it, like uh, they want the real time and the war. Uh, they just uh, hate to uh, go through the hassle to set up a data refresh and uh, and try to find a window to fit all the like the incremental refresh or the full uh, refresh into a, a, a off uh, hours in order to do this. It's just a lot of a hassle for them. Okay, but. Uh, if you if you if your data can fit in memory and if you can find such a window to do the data refresh please do so because this uh, like a investment that you have to pay upfront will save you a ton of hassles down the uh, down the road you can have the full flexibility of uh, dax measures you can write a, a lot of different DAX expressions uh, that you can possibly uh, do with uh, 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 really a much slower like a direct query data sources. And also um, it's much more fault tolerant. You can make a lot more mistakes when you build uh, models, when you write calculations, when you build uh, like an inefficient report. It can also be uh, hidden uh, by a super fast uh, VertiPack engine uh, that works locally. Uh, so. Do uh, try to do an import model if you can. Uh, I like that you cannot... missed that first. That's one of the most important things. It really is. People often think they need real time data, and then you ask them, "Well, when is a business decision made?" Oh, like once every two weeks. You probably don't need a daily refresh necessarily on that. Then maybe every um, every week or something else. And then at that point, you don't need a direct query because you don't need real time data. You just need a refresh cadence that matches when the data needs to be consumed. Yeah, that's that's a very great point. And also just because superficially it seems to be faster to build a direct query model up front <laughs> because you don't load any data, you don't have to wait for anything. Uh, that time saving may not worth the, a lot more trouble you may run into when you get super excited, when you get over the initial basic reports, get into sophisticated uh, uh, calculations uh, like a, uh, and uh, you may run into a lot more trouble down the road. So. Uh, 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 so think about the trade-off between the two approaches. Mm -hmm. So another one is if you do have to build uh, composite models, try to uh, be mindful of the drawing columns that cross the boundary. Right? So if you want to filter one table by another table, you want to try to keep them in the same uh, physical location if you can. Eventually, the drawing has to happen uh, for the tables in one physical location. That's the most efficient way to pass filters. Remember, we look at the giant query, and when we do that composite model demo, it's because uh, even though your original, the user perceived the filter is very simple, uh, like a country equals United States, but the actual filter has to be translated into the drawing column cross boundary. And the drawing column is a geography key that has a lot more uh, distinct values than just a single country value. Right? But we have to translate it into the column that actually exists in that physical location. So you have to be very mindful uh, uh, about this. So uh, if, if you can, try to keep them in the same place. For example, uh, uh, we, we have this uh, dual um, uh, storage mode that the same uh, table can be stored uh, in both the remote uh, relational database and also can be imported then you get the best of both worlds. So when you don't need to uh, join, for example, if you only need uh, data from a one dimension table, like a slicer or something like that, then it will be fully local. And But if you do want to uh, do uh, hit the uh, transaction table, the, the fact table, and uh, but you want to uh, apply some filters to it because the table also exists in the remote relational database location, it's a dual mode, and then we can just push a simple filter to the query because the filter and the join will be happening uh, completely on the remote side uh, and without the need to transfer uh, a very expensive materialized filter that cross the boundary and send over to the remote side. Uh, again, try to build a star schema or snowflake schema as we, uh, and, the, and the, the reason is we know, we know that we have a dimension queries. If your dimension columns come from the fact table, dimension queries become fact table queries. Like uh, in our demo, we say that a date key 
coming from the fact table uh, instead of a dedicated calendar table, then the many when when the dimension query cannot be eliminated, that becomes another expensive uh, uh, fact table scan. And you can have uh, many more of this, right? And depending on uh, whether the dimension queries can be eliminated or not, right? And uh, I already mentioned that when you do have a, a, a cross-boundary uh, relationship, you want to be mindful about the cardinality of the join column because any filter on one side can become a giant filter materialized in the underlying SQL query or DAX query in the case of direct query to uh, AS engine and uh, that query tax can be huge and uh, uh, depending on the obviously depending on the selectivity of the filters and uh, try to keep DAX calculation as simple as possible <laughs> because uh, in the case of this a complex DAX calculation sometimes uh, like a uh, in the demo, we have that error function in there uh, is actually causing uh, like the dimension query cannot be eliminated. As a result, we hit the one million error, error uh, which is really bad. Avoid dense uh, measures. We already talked about that. And uh, you want to test the performance against the real data as early as possible. When people work against a large data amount, it's very practical and reasonable to start small. You do a sample of the database so you can build up your more, uh, your, your model quickly. If you follow the like a star schema, keep every, uh, calculation simple, then you wouldn't uh, run into a problem when you switch to the bigger data. But once you started writing, uh, doing like a by die, doing complex calculations, you want to test them against the real data as early as possible because uh, those complex calculations and the complex uh, uh, schema uh, tend to be the reason why some of the optimizations that we mentioned uh, earlier cannot kick in and uh, therefore you are going to hit a lot more queries than you thought you would, like, uh, more dimension queries on fact table, those kind of things. So you want to start a real testing as early as possible. Test the low level security as, as early as uh, possible. Low level security has a special meaning to, the, to, to those dimension queries. As a result of a low level security, many of the dimension queries cannot be eliminated, uh, unfortunately. Therefore, uh, but unfortunately, many people want to test their full report and without a low level security first, right? Many people say, let's make sure all the functionalities I want yeah. there. They spend months building their reports, writing complex calculations, and only test the low level security toward the end. If you have a composite model, I would say you want to start a low level security testing as early as you can. Uh, better, uh, like uh, do some very simple low level security rules to test against your complex uh, schema design and the calculations. Right? And uh, another thing is uh, you notice that the summarized columns uh, in the in data semantics, it doesn't have any top end clause. And there's nothing similar to the SQL top end or having clause. And the reality is it doesn't have it. So many people are applying the Power BI's, uh, like a value filters and top end filters. They think they should be just translated as SQL top end and the value filters. Unfortunately, it's not. They have actually different semantics. That's the main reason why it cannot be pushed. Not only is it not a part of a summarized columns, it just cannot be pushed simply because they don't have the same semantics as a, 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 a SQL server. Okay? So that you, you may want to know. Last but not on the list, and uh, when you have a, a slow backend, you want to minimize cross filters between visuals. Right now, uh, one of the like a nice thing about the Power BI is all the videos are fully interactive. You can click on a table and then it will filter all the other videos on the same page. That's fun to have when you have a super fast backend, but your, when, when your backend is slow, uh, you may want to minimize uh, the cross filtering. Even mi minimize cross filtering between like a slicers, for example. And that can actually greatly slow you down because every accidental click, sometimes you don't want to click anything. You don't want to select the table, but you click on it and then the table have you have like 20 columns on it. Then that becomes a huge 20 column filter passed to all the other visuals. So it will greatly slow you down. And if you uh, just by accidentally click on the table, just want to select that visual. So again, these are some high level guidance when you build a, a, a content model and the direct query model. So I'm, I'm sorry. I I'm, love that you provided. Uh, no, this is this is fun. I love that you provided a lot of key takeaways. Um, I think uh, overall, you know, the, the number one you've certainly listed at the top, which is just this is a co composite models, direct query, any other type of model besides import should be used when needed because there are so many other considerations to have. Pretty much everything you list below this uh, are things that are worsened when using anything that is not a standard import model. Uh, like many of these still are 
practices like star schemas, of course, you want to still try to implement as much as possible, even in an import model, but they're exacerbated um, in any other type of um, model configuration environment. Yeah, that's a great summary. And uh, so many people didn't realize that the dramatic performance difference <laughs> and the fault tolerance between import and the direct query until too late. Exactly. Um, and what I'd love to do now is let's uh, let's spend about 15 minutes. Uh, there's a couple questions that I got in the chat. And then as time permitting, there is a few from those forums that I'll try to get answered. Uh, but um, okay. yeah, let, let's see what we can get through. I'll switch back over to our, uh, here we go, main screen. Perfect. And let me spit a couple of these up onto the page and I'll, I'll read them off. So Matthias had one. Uh, and wanted to know, will DAX be limited to Microsoft products in the future? Uh, and I think I can paraphrase to say not necessarily because other products can connect to models with DAX, but it's whether or not DAX as a coding language will be used in other uh, non-Microsoft products. Well, uh, of course, it's up to the other companies. Uh, DAX is not, even though we have a pattern on DAX, uh, it's basically said that you cannot just replicate our uh, <laughs> basically DAX engine. Yeah. But uh, uh, just based on what just, uh, even though today we just have a cursory review of what a DAX engine does, you can tell that nobody actually would even uh, want to try it. That's just <laughs> too expensive to build. DAX engine yeah. is, uh, takes many, many years, and uh, it's a very th expensive thing to, to build. But in terms of uh, using DAX, I, I, I don't think there's any limitation about uh, uh, just using DAX as a query and calculation in some other products. But without a DAX engine, I don't see how they can possibly uh, achieve the same results uh, for the, on, yeah. on the calculation part. They, 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 they have to rely on our DAX engine to do the uh, uh, high fidelity uh, execution of things. Well, like, it's but the very package. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, that was a good question. Uh, one from Brian Grant. Uh, I actually, like love the fact that he brought this up. Um, also, another another person I would consider very high level in terms of his understanding of DAX. But can row context be understood uh, as a stack of tables the way filter context can be? Um, he understands the uh, intuition of row context as well, but would love to get a better better understanding of the internals. Yeah, the row context. Uh, uh... Yeah, you, you, you can think about it's actually it's much simpler. You can think about it as a stack of table, but it's more it's simpler than that. It's a stack of rows from different tables, uh, <laughs> yeah. for different tables. You can think about it like a nested loops. If you have like a, a sum x of sum x of sum x, then you just have a three uh, table scans, and then mm -hmm. the innermost expression will be able to see three rows in the sum uh, in the sum sum x on the outside. So you can it's more like a like a programming language. You have a for loop. And then you just have a, like a nested loops. Uh, Perfect. Um, I, th I think I was understanding this one, but let, let's see if we can translate. So Mar Marshall is, uh, he can create a table with DAX queries generated by DAX Studio Query Builder, um, including treat as in an Excel spreadsheet. His understanding is that treat as is not supported in Excel. Well, uh, right now Excel is, uh, is uh, well, again, uh, in the past, Excel uh, has its own release cycle, and mm -hmm. uh, it may be updated uh, yearly. Therefore, it may be behind uh, in terms of our monthly release cadence. But uh, now Excel is releasing much faster. So they, uh, I believe that, I assume you're talking about the power pivots inside Excel, the data yeah. tax engine inside Excel. I believe it's already, uh, uh, they're they are actually updating much uh, more frequently than before. So it's uh, it's caught up. The trade is definitely already in there. but. Uh, Excel is uh, can query DAX engine using the they are using the MDX queries. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest difference. And the uh, MDX query they set the filters in its own way. It does not uh, use the DAX not like in DAX query where using us to generate the filters. They they are just not uh, generating it. It's not like they cannot uh, do it. it. They are just not doing it. Perfect. Uh, I have one last one from Sheila that's actually about composite models. I like this one. It's a scenario and kind of when do you, uh, it's an import versus composite question. So uh, if you have two separate star schemas, uh, two separate different sets of data from the business, did you, should you import both of them into the same model um, versus using direct query for Power BI? And uh, uh, that's a very good question. So you have to think about uh, the interactivity between the two, uh, between the tables in the two schemas, right? If mm -hmm. you want a lot of interactivities, as, and also depend on the size, right? So if the like uh, the, the 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 cross uh, uh, the, the the relationship between the uh, two tables on two sides, if it has a high cardinality columns, then import is always the best choice. 
that will give the best performance. But <laughs> exactly. uh, on the other hand, if you just want to produce uh, two different reports, mostly from uh, uh, just a, like a separate side, you have a very limited interactivity between the tables on the side. You just want to put everything on a single report, then you, you then there's no need to import both. So you can just keep a direct query. And also, if you have a very limited interactivity between the two sides, and you can have full control of it, as long as you can control the cardinality of the filters and the filter columns, then uh, direct query may be an easier uh, solution because uh, it will be uh, important with, uh, that there is a hassle of uh, setting them up, everything. I, I agree with it. So it, uh, depending on your actual, like a final uh, usage scenario, our company, the model we always recommend it is uh, be mindful about uh, the size of the filters flowing across, flowing across the boundary of those company models. As long as you, you know that, yep. then uh, you, you know your design decision. And just to, to roll off of the, the mention that you said about the it depends, anytime, as a reminder for people in the chat, anytime you hear that, that always means from a consultant perspective, we need more information. Once we have enough information, then you can decide which is the two. And it usually just means you need to dive deeper into the, the, the business requirements, like, like Jeffrey just mentioned, and uh, what are the use cases uh, for one or the other. And it, you know, it's basically a pro-con comparison because it's... It, de it depending, either one can be a correct answer for for that business situation. Uh, I have one last one in the chat that I want to pop up, and then I'm going to switch over to some of the ones that I have queued up uh, from the the forum. So, uh, Mikhail had one about uh, he get, uh, gets a group across supply error in a composite model. I'm not sure if you have any info on that or not, or if that's going to be a it depends um, answer. Well, of course, it depends on what the error is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard for me to say what exactly sure. why without seeing the error message itself. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that one, so I didn't know if you have any, like, well, commonly it's applied to this. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, need a little bit more information to actually be able to, to know exactly the cause of that. Uh, but but, yeah, but me... it's a good thing to mention that the uh, uh, group, uh, group cross-apply is very similar to summarize columns. It will be a core function uh, in the new composite model so the new composite model is taking an incoming DAX query, which may be summarized columns, and tr try to translate it into an equivalent query to the remote one. And uh, so we originally even call group cross apply summarized columns table or something like that, a, a, a function name that's very similar to summarized columns. But eventually uh, the, we decided to use this name. So you can almost think of this like a, a something that is similar to summarized columns with uh, some small uh, semantics difference. Perfect. All right, I queued up a couple that I can put on. So this was one of the questions that I got off of the uh, the forms that I posted to social media. So it's a longer question, so I'll do a part one and part two, just so we can read the whole thing. Uh, this person was trying to search for DAX queries in a public report, and when they enabled tracing, they came across something called XMLA query. And then part two, send up here, there we go. Uh, can we discuss what language is the analytic? the analysis services speaks other than DAX and MDX and uh, you know essentially what is the XMLA query? Okay and uh, since we only have a couple of minutes so uh, so first of all is XMLA is a public API you can study mm -hmm. it uh, on the internet and the XMLA basically you can you can think about it is a uh, it's a it's a standard for any client application to talk to AS Engine. You can use XMLA to send the DAX queries or MDX queries uh, to the AS Engine and uh, receive the result also in this XML uh, based result. And uh, uh, if you can show my screen, I can show you a couple of XMLA. Uh, uh, are we still sharing my screen? Now and, uh, I can go or, back over to it. Oop. You okay, might want to yeah. flip off so, though, so it don't I, get a recursion. <laughs> Flip off of the, this to this page though, because we're getting a recursion right now. Okay. So. All right. I'm going to go back to us. So so flip to another site uh, other than the. Uh, okay. There we go. But cool. I need to, I <laughs> there need you go. Okay. Yeah, per, so first perfect. one is uh, uh, XMA. You can you can you can just do search. It's a it's an industry standard. It's not just limited to Microsoft. So you can read the full details of XMA. It's it's a very boring uh, spec, but there are plenty of uh, public information on the internet and. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, uh, if you look at the, the no, uh, sorry. No worries. Uh, where is my other screen? So if you look at uh, some examples of how we use XMA, you can use XMLA to send a query. So DAX query, and uh, in this case, it's a MDX query, can be just a payload inside XMLA. So the whole thing is XMLA, and uh, this part is the query part. 
is the query text. But of course, and XML can be used for other purposes, to send other payload to the AS engine. I'm using this XML to discover to for the ask AS engine to send me all the measures. And I'm using this XML command. Uh, no, this is why it's a query one. And I'm using this XML to ask uh, AS Engine to give, to give me all the metadata. I'm using this XML to tell AS Engine to load this PBX file <coughs> and uh, to generate an internal model from it. So XML A is a generic uh, public API XML based that uh, uh, allow uh, any client application to uh, basically it's a standard way for client application to communicate with S engine and the communication for can, for can be for many different purposes while the DAX and the MDX are only the query aspect of the communication there's a lot of other communication going on between the two and you have to use the XML as the standard you can actually write your some people are trying to write a Java client talk to S engine <laughs> and how do you know to generate so so what is the format the format is XML Perfect. Yeah, like uh, you said, it's, it's, it's the, the, it's the, the, the public. Yeah. Go ahead. There's a lot of Microsoft extension to it. Just, I just want to mention it's a, not Ooh. every single MLA is a, a industry standard. <laughs> Perfect. All right, uh, let's um, let's do two more questions that I got off of the uh, uh, the list here, or at least ones that I that I particularly liked. So I'll go back to here, and then this will be another two parter. So part one, bring this up for the first sentence. Are there any plans to make the hidden row number column visible for the users, and then? Part two is, I know the engine has a sorting algorithm that shuffles it, so any business logic can get messed up. But uh, is it possible to make it visible in a controlled scenario just for the sake of learning or testing or any other um, type of uh, coding? OK, for the hidden columns, actually, uh, the early days of DAX, the hidden column was exposed. Uh, the, 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 the row number column was exposed. Okay, But eventually, we decided to hide it for a couple of reasons. Uh, obviously, the, the, the reason even uh, uh, one of the known reasons is uh, the row numbers are not stable. Uh, uh, when you do a data refresh, the same row may, may, be, may be assigned a different row number. Therefore, we don't want any people to actually rely on it. We don't want any business logic to say, I want to filter by row number equals what. We cannot guarantee that. Fair. And so we, uh, that's the uh, that's one of the key reasons we want to hide it. And uh, another reason is, for example, in direct query, the original table does not have the row number. It gets, gives us a lot of flexibility to do the internal things. So I would advise that if you do want to uh, use uh, the row number, then uh, some people say, I want to do it for learning purpose. Then why don't you just the Power Query part of uh, Power, uh, the Power BI to actually add an index column? Uh, Power Query have uh, this feature. You can do it yourself, even which is treat as a, a row number. And we can also, mm -hmm. uh, if you just want to kind of like a, a, a identifier of a row, we can introduce a hash function to basically hash the content of the row to to produce a stable hash value mm -hmm. per row. That's not guarantee uniqueness. That's uh, but uh, that can maybe can uh, solve some problems. But uh, we are so we yeah we have no plan to uh, to make a row number public. We, it's a good we, we suggestion though. It. Uh, is that just just using uh, Power Query if you need to to add that index column for 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 learning and testing purposes? But uh, yeah. like you said, the you know, initially ex um, it was exposed, but then I think due to to performance and, and other concerns, you, you decided to like basically put it back behind the curtain. Yeah. All right, last one. I'm going to. Oh, pop I'm up. sorry. What, what's the second part? The, the second answer is uh, the engine has a sort of shuffles so that many business can be messed up. Uh, please make it visible. It, in yep, that, that, that was the same, second part of the, the question that we just answered. Well, uh, when you say the, the shuffle, it, uh, I'll show you talking about when you refresh data. Mm. and uh, But uh, you can always uh, uh, specify the. Uh, the sorting in the in the source query, right? So you can you can control the the, the mm. sorting yourself by supplying a custom query to, as the input. Uh, this way, uh, it is stable. I, I assume this uh, sorting is referring to during data refresh. So I, you can you, you can add it yourself in the source query. Yep. Yeah, it is in Power Query. Um, last one that I'm going to bring up. Uh, somebody asked: uh, Every serious programming language has a debugger. Can we ever expect one for DAX? Besides, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, Stack Studio and other stuff. Yeah, very good question. Actually, uh, we have been talking about a debugger for DAX uh, since day one, okay? And it never received a serious funding uh, consideration for this reason. Remember, we are a self-service tool, okay? We are targeting business analysts who are not software engineers. Right? They, mm -hmm. they may not be familiar with uh, what the software engineers yeah. consider as a debugger. Right? That's one important reason. And another reason is, uh, in my opinion, okay. right now, Many of the reasons people want to use a debugger is because uh, we, we today we're talking about is because measures are abstract. 
So it's kind of hard, okay? But and the measures are especially hard, and also because today I mentioned the measures are independent of each other, right? So sometimes you want to, you really want to do a dependency between the two calculations. I have, for example, I have a sum of cells. I want to do a, a rolling, a moving average of the cells. So I'm, I want to define another calculation that will refer to the sum of cells. I already have the numbers here, and then I want to. Uh, do a ranking of it, I want to do a yeah. moving average, I want to do a running total, those kind of calculations. It's, it's those are more complex calculations that requires a debugging. So when you are not getting what you want, you tend to want a debugger for it. But uh, uh, in, in, my, in my opinion, in the next few years, we first want to uh, introduce a different way of doing those calculations. So they are, they are not that hard to do, and they produce mm. a much more like, easy results. So you don't need a debugger to begin with. For those calculations, I'm not saying eventually uh, uh, there will still be calculations that deserve the debugger. But uh, with given uh, limited resources, I would focus focus on the new paradigm of calculations. That's not just like a abstract measures only. And we can do some Excel like uh, calculations that uh, you can look at these numbers. And I want to add up these numbers. Yep. We can call it a visual calculation. Then to me, it's a much better investment to eliminate the need to begin with, rather than trying to make you to debug through complex uh, expressions. Perfect. Um, I do know there's more questions than everything else, but we are 45 past, so I think I'll use this question. Yes, to, <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Um, the ones with you and like with Marco, when we do deep dives, I'm happy to go uh, over as much as needed. And um, a couple of people are even asking for, you know, like follow up. So someday in the future, I'd absolutely love to have you back on. But thank you so much for, for taking the time out today for all of this. Uh, people learned a lot, uh, even the ones who were like, you know what, 80% of this is going over my head, but I'm still, for the bits that isn't, I'm still learning a lot. So I think this was a really great um, back end dive into just the, the the core functionality of DAX and also just uh, again I think one of the most pivotal uh, pivotal features of um, the Power BI evolution in the last 12 months has been the, the composite models um, with, with direct query over analysis services and Power BI data sets it's always a mouthful to say but it's a great feature um, so yeah Jeff uh, Jeffrey thanks again for um, joining today and I hope you have That's a good rest of your Thursday yeah yeah, thanks everybody for bearing with me for the past one hour and 45 minutes. I appreciate <laughs> that. Thanks for, for inviting me over. All right, everybody have a great day. Enjoy the rest of the night, wherever you are. Exactly, Bye. and cheers. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider hitting that like and subscribe button. And if you want to help support this channel, take a look at our channel memberships as well. And last but not least, please consider sharing this video on social media to help pass on this awesome content and to help the channel grow. So until next time.